you know, I would like to kick off the event by inviting Dr. Sri Idris Jala um, to the stage. Dr. Sri Idris. I mean, the guitar's out, folks. <laughs> the floor's all yours. Thank you for coming. If you, uh, if you follow Idris Jala on Twitter, there are three of them. But the real one is the one with this guitar. <laughs> no sound, is it? Can you hear? Yeah. Cannot hear. Bolega, Bolega. No sound, huh? Sound check. They can't hear, man. Nothing to do this. I have uh, done quite a lot of uh, uh, serious business presentation, but I also do now and in four years I do a gig, but I've never done both at the same time. <laughs> so this is quite uh, challenging. In fact, uh, I've always told someone if you can do many things at a time, it'd be much more exciting. I love fishing. If that fish pond here. I do the transformation blues and do the guitar and the fish at the same time. That would be ideal too. And a plus, it would be nice if we had some beers there too. Yeah, I 
agree. Eh? <laughs> I will not try to be an, a comedian because I will completely fail if I try to do that. Let me mention what we're trying to do in the ETP. You know, everything you do in trying to move forward, uh, you must have true north. If you don't have a direction where you're heading in life, you will get lost. So it's very important to know where you're heading. In the ETP, we have defined true north to comprise three things. Number one, gross national income is the measure of the wealth of the nation. So GNI is the measure of the wealth of the nation. Why is GNI chosen rather than GDP? The reason is very simple. We do that simply because the world regards GNI as the measure of the wealth of the nation because it takes GDP into account. It also takes into account money that is remitted for Malay by Malaysian companies that operate abroad. So if there are companies operating in Malaysia, if they remit the money abroad, so you take the difference between them called a net factor income abroad. So in fact, in our case, there is more money leaving the country than money coming in at the current moment. But it's important for us to say that the GDP plus net factor income abroad comprises GNI. So that's first through north. And our measure is by the year 2020, we need to make sure that we achieve 1.7 trillion ringgit of gross national income by the year 2020. Second, we need to create jobs because it's no good having high gross national income when uh, we can't share the prosperity of the nation with the people. So we need to create a lot of jobs. In the GDP, um, the ETP document, you see clearly that we intend to uh, grow the jobs in Malaysia so that 3.3 million jobs will be added. That's very important for us. And so the third one is to make sure that we get investments. If there are no investments, there are no projects. If there are no projects, there are no jobs. If there are no jobs, clearly people will be unhappy. Lah. So if there are no investment, we cannot grow our gross national income. So investment is very important. We have clearly identified we need to have a cumulative investment between now and the year 2020. 1.4 trillion ringgit of investment. So those are the three definitions of true north. Some people ask the question, Okay, it is you, you set those targets, but how do you get there? And our view is today is very simple. Some of you remember, I maybe mean, not many of you remember, like you're too young. People like Fendi and, and myself, we know this. Many years ago, we used to be we used to beat South Korea in many things, <coughs> including football. Huh? And today they've beaten us on quite a number of grounds. And so if you look at them and Singapore and many other nations that reach high income status. There were two things that they did right. Two, uh, not three, two. Number one is about being focused. You cannot be good in everything under the sun. If you want to be good in everything under the sun, you will end up being Mr. Average or Mrs. Average. So being focused on the sectors that will make the difference. So we have said, we have more than 40 different sectors or subsectors, but we have agreed that there are 12 areas of focus. We want to focus on those because that's the one that we have the best opportunity for growing our economy. This is what we call the national key economic areas focus. You see, if you are Usain Paul, if Usain Paul wants to be the Olympic champion of the world in running, he also wants to be the a swimming champion of the world, a marathon swimming champion of the world, he also wants to be, name it whatever he wants to do it, he will probably end up not winning any of those. So focus is key. Second thing that one needs to do is to make sure that you create the conditions for competitiveness to flourish. So if you are focused, but you're not competitive, not Yasu, you cannot make it too. If Usain Bolt, is focused on running, but every day he sleeps and doesn't practice, he will start losing. Already he lost the 100 and 200 to uh, his friend and colleague, Blake. And so it's very important to be competitive. So what do we do? We have 51 strategic reform initiatives to create the conditions 
for competitiveness of flourish in Malaysia, such as anti-competition law. That's why we introduce anti-competition law, such as making sure that companies in Malaysia implement the best practice, best standards. We have 6,000 standards that cut through most of our industries. Only 10% of them are complied with today. We need to make as many companies adopt the best practices and the best standards so that we are kiasu and competitive. So when we can do two things, make sure that we are focused on this NKEA, make sure that we are competitive by implementing the strategic reform initiatives, then I think we are on the way to getting there. Let me look at some of the very early signs of success. Last year, translating the gross national income, the job and the investment numbers into last year's target, we originally put a target of for our G and I at 797 billion ringgit. That was our G and I target. Last year, ladies and gentlemen, we surpassed it. We achieved 830 billion ringgit last year. So we take the first one. Second one, investment. Private investment numbers, the target was 83 billion ringgit. But last year, we actually achieved 94 billion ringgit. Again, take. On jobs, we intended to create 330,000 jobs. We didn't quite make the target. We achieved total jobs created was 330,000 jobs. So we're 95% of the target. So we made two, we didn't quite make one. But nonetheless, I believe that going forward, we will be able to create more of the jobs going forward. And so, if you want to know more about the details of what we're doing there, please go to the Pomandu website. We've got a, a very thick report for the hardworking people, 250 pages on the ETP, another 200 over pages on the GTP. So if you're lazy, it's okay, because we also had a 50 pages executive summary. If you are very lazy, we've got a six minute video. So please come to the Pomandu web website. If you don't like to go to the Pomandu website, you can come to my own. I have a small little uh, blog, which I don't invest a lot on. I put the Transformation Blues article there, but I also put the videos there uh, to make sure that uh, you then begin to be appraised for what is happening on the ground. So to me, the early signs are looking good. I'm reminded that uh, I used to work in London for four years, and I, I was in Shell. Shell treated me really well. They gave me a really nice house. I lived in Cobham, a fantastic house. And uh, I remember that house really well, but one day they said to me, Chris, you know, you, you worked here for four years, we want like to go back to Malaysia. And so the prospect of coming back to Malaysia to live in Taman Tun wasn't so nice here. Because at that time when, when we lived in, in Cobham, we had a really nice house. We had uh, my private tennis court there, we had three Italian gardeners who I lived like a lord. Coming back, it was, I was sweating in Tamantun. Nonetheless, although Tamantun wasn't as nice as, as he was in, the, in Cobham, I always felt Malaysia is a really nice country. You know, when I was in London, every day I looked out into the, to check if the sun was shining on that day. Even for two hours, it was good. Right? You know, sometimes when you're living abroad, then you realize how blessed we are as a country with a lot of good things. That said, let me mention a couple of things. I always want to tell people, we must always look at the bright side of life. There's always the dark side. On my Twitter account, you see I quote Helen Keller, keep your face in the sun and you will never see shadows. I know because people wrote to me, it is, yeah, but you can't keep looking at the sun. It will burn your face. <laughs> Figuratively, that's correct. Lah. But you, I don't ask you, I don't recommend that you really look at the real sun all day long. But let me mention, it's tragic when we stop living. It's even more tragic when we stop living simply because we fail to see the roses blooming outside our windows. A lot of roses blooming outside our windows. Because we only dream of that magical rose garden in the horizon. And that's a magical rose garden in the horizon. It's not real. What is real is the roses blooming outside our windows. In Malaysia, I can tell you, I'm privileged to be working in, in the government to play a small part in seeing how as a nation we're building, begin to plant the seeds 
of innovation to transform the country. I see the, the roses blooming outside our windows. The GNI is rising, the investments are coming through. By the way, the highest private investment last year, in 10 years was last year. We achieved record GNI last year. We achieved record GDP because our country continued to grow. The highest foreign direct investment in 10 years was last year. We grew our total FDI investment by 12%, thank you. If I now flip that and say what other records did we have on the uh, on roads, because I come from rural community. My, by the way, my village still do not have electricity today. You know, so if you guys complain about traffic jam in KL, wait until you go to Bariola. And if you say worry about the elect current electricity not there, places where I come from, we still struggle there. Nonetheless, last year we built a record kilometers of rural road. Altogether, 1,000 kilometers of rural roads were built because of the GTP. And I'm very proud of that achievement uh, as a government. Couple of other things. We had the best UPSR result in four years last year because of the school enrollment program. I know people will dispute the fact, but the fact of the matter today is on the stats. Crime reduction was the highest last year compared to previous years. Let me mention here, at no point did I ever blame the media. I never blamed the media for perception of crime. I only responded to a question that was raised before. The question was this. Someone asked me the question. How do you measure reduction in crime? I said the way to measure reduction in crime is to count the number of incidents of crime. When we first started in 2009, the total incidence of crime that happened in Malaysia is 209,000 incidents of crime in the whole year of 2009. Divide by 365 days, that is 575 crime incidents per day. Per day, 575 incidents of crime per day. Right. Last year, we brought that down to 157,000 incidents of crime. Divided by 365 days, that's 430 incidents of crime per day. Yes, it has come down. So that means there are 430 incidents of crime. You cannot use a report that says that there is another report here of an incident of crime. That's another one. I count there are 10 of them that I have heard of, and therefore I conclude that crime is risen. The reality is today, even after we have reduced the crime, we still have 430 per day. You know? So my point was, in response was, if you want to write a story on all of the 430 incidents of crime per day, the whole newspaper from page one to the last page is only on crime. Because it's 430. So my point in response was, you do not do a statistical analysis on the reduction of crime by looking at a report here and a report there. Because no report is enough to cover all the incidences of crime that took place. So I do not blame the media. So please, if there was anyone that alluded to the fact that Idris Jala is blaming the media for fear of a crime, no. The reality today is that there are 430 incidents of crime per day in Malaysia, but that is a reduced from the original number of 575 uh, incidents of crime per day in 2009. So let's be clear about that one. So quite a number of other records that we, we've seen. Trade, total trade last year, we achieved 1.27 trillion of total trade. That means export plus import. That is one of the highest numbers we've achieved since independence. Only two years in the past that we achieved the same number, 1.27 trillion ringgit of total trade. So I would say today, I think that probably there's a lot more reason to celebrate about what is happening in our country. A lot more reason to say the roses are blooming outside the windows. Suddenly they took away my seat. He said, if I talk too long, you get bored. in a while you listen to someone who writes a song and I kind of you feel that wow I wish I had written that song 
guy called Kev Moore, he's black from the US. He's written this beautiful song called City Boy. The first time I heard that song when I was in London, I said, I wish I had written that song. I kind of felt that the guy wrote the song for me, you know. And uh, it's a really beautiful song. I'm sorry if I don't do justice to it, but nonetheless, I'll try. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great question. I can tell you this. Last year, I joined the Prime Minister and we, he went to declare open a small project in Sarawak. You know, those folks out there didn't have electricity all their lives. So when the Prime Minister went out there 
to open it, I was there. You know, it was really incredible. The guys, when the Prime Minister said, let there be light, there was light. It was really incredible. Those folks out there, it meant so much to them. There was, a, I think there was an old lady that wanted to touch his nose just to check whether he was a real human being or not. But nonetheless, you know where I come from. Yes, day before yesterday, they have now put the pole in Barrio, the first pole to put the solar electrification. And so it really would make a real difference because we, what they will do is for that village, the first pole, they will, I think, light up a few long houses. Lah. And that's a very, very good start. So I expect and I hope that at least uh, in the next few years, some of my folks will also be able to have some electricity. And that would be really great. By the way, we're not alone. There are many, many other people in Malaysia, in certain parts of Malaysia, in Sabah and Sarawak, we do need, still need to have some basic infrastructure. And that's part of our GDP. Next question. Yes. It's been in the news recently that no Malaysian has gotten into Harvard for the past two years. Uh, Ms. Pamandu, do you have anything specific to tackle that? Come again, mate. Um, there is no Malaysian who has gotten into Harvard for the oh, past two years. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm pretty sure you know about that. Yeah. Um, is Pamandu doing anything specific to tackle that issue? <laughs> That's news to me. I have to say that I didn't know that Malaysians didn't get to Harvard in the last few years. Let me return to the point about what we're doing about education. One of the first things that we're doing was to begin the program to improve the quality of education in Malaysia. So when we look at countries that have done so, take Finland as an example. It is world, it is recognized globally that Finland have really have fantastic preschool education system. So if you want to start improving education, you cannot just address it at the university level because you have to improve the feedstock. 60% of our kids who get to primary one have been to preschool. 60% have not been to preschool. So what we're doing is to make sure as many kids get to preschool. So that's the first thing we do. We have 9,814 primary and secondary schools in Malaysia. We've ranked every single one of them from the good to the bad and ugly. We originally wanted to publish them in that order, you know, which is the best, which is number 9,814. And of course, when we said we were going to do that, the headmasters freaked out. They said, you can't go and tell everybody that my school is number 9,814. Because if we did so, no parents would send the kids there. So eventually what was agreed that we published them in bands. Band 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so the point about why we needed to rank them was so that we encourage every one of those schools to come up with a school improvement program. And so that's why the UPSR result, I believe, we came up to the best result in, in four years. Let me give a simple example of what's happening in some of that. Let's suppose in Kuala Lipis, like, these two gentlemen are teachers, huh? this argument sake, huh? both of them teach history and geography in primary four in Kuala Lipis at school day. When we look at the result, all the students that uh, study geography for this man that take the photograph. They all fail over the last four years. But he, for geography, very poor. But he's a good teacher for history. His friend that's lying happily in the pink sofa, he's uh, doing also teaching history and geography. The reverse is happening. So when we put the results side by side for earth per teachers, all the headmaster needed to do was let this guy just teach history because he's poor geography and let him do geography, don't do history. That was all. There was no rocket science in doing that. But the data need to inform people about the decisions that need to be made. There were some, many of those kinds of things that were made to give the results. And so that is what we're doing at preschool. That said, we are working on GTP Mark II. Under GTP Mark II, we are now going a full revamp of the education system. Prime Minister and DPM have agreed that we will really, really do this. By the way, we have run the lab, we finished the lab on it, and we tested uh, 7,000 teachers who are teaching English today in our schools. We took them and asked them to sit for the English test. We know who failed and who passed. I will not tell you how many failed and how many passed. Huh? And so what we will do is we will take the ones who have failed the English test, 
and we put them through a heavy duty immersion program on English grammar. And these are some of the very fundamental things that we have to do to improve the quality of education. And so, and we will hopefully, uh, between now and the end of the year, we'll put all the 70,000 English teachers to sit for the test. And so that we will know who cannot do, who can do. Because you can't talk about these things in general, in generality, because you've got to know who cannot and who can. Who's the one who cannot do it, they're the one that require the, uh, if you like, the, the actual training. So, all cutting across at university level, we're also trying to make sure that our students get to go to university and improving the quality at university. So, so right from kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, and intervention in universities. That said, we also need to make sure that our vocational schools are good. And I think there is a big area that we need to improve in the vocational uh, school uh, institution. Hopefully, uh, some some for gas can get to Harvard. I don't know. I really don't know whether they went. Whether you're right or wrong, I'm not sure. Maybe you're right. You know, nobody's been there. But I think there must be some that went to the other school, like Oxford and Cambridge and others. Maybe we'll have to check the data. Next question. Uh, yes. Idris? Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, there's a question from Twitter. Okay. Uh, someone asked, what can the man on the street do for the ETP and GTC? Okay. Couple of things. The first thing that the man in the street can do with the ETP and GDP is, you know, consumption. 60%, 70% of our GDP is consumption. Remember this, consumption. 70% or 69% of our GDP is made of consumption. The more you buy, the more the economy grows. Very important. So go to Mama's store and Makan. Go to the shopping mall and that's normal. Consumption, private consumption, and public consumption form the lion's share of our GDP. So all of your consumption is very important. Number two, the men in the street, more than 20% of our GDP is made up of investment. If you invest money, you are contributing to the economy. So not only spending the money, you can invest, uh, contribute directly to the GDP. Investing your money is also contributing to GDP. So. GDP is made up of, very simple, consumption, the biggest component, number two, investment. So if you invest, that's counted. And number three, trade. So the man in the street, if you are in business, if everything that you import is also part of our definition of what constitutes our GDP. And if you export, that's also part of the GDP. So the export minus import, net trade is what counts. Net trade. So if we import too much, but we export very little, then cannot. So those are the three components. So number one, consumption. Number two, investment. Number three, trade. And finally, stock law or inventory. But the main industry doesn't quite understand that one. So again, to be clear, that's what it is. So that's the demand side of the economy. If you look at the supply side of the economy, then you look at them sectorally. How much of that is translated into each of the various sectors, oil and gas, oil palm, etc. Et that is what we so I think hopefully that, that, that helps to simplify it. So hopefully the men in the street understand. Everything you buy in the shopping mall is part of the economy. Thank you. Sorry, okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, just bringing the issue back to education. Uh, what do you think um, about the current policy of having a dual track system to, of entry into the local universities, um, basically the Mapta right, uh, Renda Science Mapta, and the STPM having this dual track system um, of entry into local universities, um, how do you think that impacts um, education in Malaysia in general, um, higher education for example? My comment is the following. When we form Malaysia, we all agree that this is the one unique thing that was part of how we want to develop our country. Because we are blessed as, as a country that we are so diverse. And so the diversity is one of the things that make this a very rich country. And so the education system came through as a result of the agreement of our leaders to say that what we needed to do was to allow for national schools to coexist with vernacular uh, schools to coexist alongside them. Now, I think for me the issue is whether you have 
double track or single track. The one thing that's indisputable is quality and quality and quality. You can have single track, you can double track, but if, there's, if the quality is suspect, then, then there's a problem. I do believe it's important for quality to exist in the Chinese school, in the Indian Tamil school, and also the English, the, the government school too. I think if you can improve the quality, you'll get there. So I think, to my mind, it's not so much a question of single track or double track, more importantly, the, the, the quality. Sorry, yeah. Can I just clarify? Yeah, maybe I didn't get your no, question. I wasn't exactly um, asking about the fact that Sorry. vernacular schools and okay. all that, uh, but I mean um, the the fact that um, STPM people who have to go through STPM are mostly um, non Bumiputra, whereas those that go into the marked up science uh, track uh, tend mostly the majority, ninety percent being um, Bumiputra. And whether rightly or wrongly, I think this has led to the perception by some that um, it has resulted in, like for example, racial quotas in oh. our local universities for example. So do you think this is a policy that should be continued, should be maintained, or is something that should be looked into as well? This this perception perhaps that um that there is a difference in let's say as you mentioned the quality of education in both streams and um, whether you should continue separating it or whether it should be merged so that um the perception at least the part that is that it's okay. Sorry, I, I missed that. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, it's all right. Yeah. It's all right. I think for me, the question is very simple. I do believe in choice. We must give people options and choices. And I think it will be a really dull world if you were to say no choice. And so in Malaysia, we give people the choice. But I think one, one of the, still the comment I made is whether quality is key. We really need to make sure that the quality in both the A and the B needs to be there. So, okay, uh, but do you think the, per the perception is uh, justified then, that there is a difference in quality? Well, the data suggests not so. Oh, really? Yeah, the data okay. suggests not so, but I mean, depends on what you mean by quality. Like. So if we were to ask them to sit for a common test yeah. that exists, then perhaps we will we'll see the result. One of the things that I ask people to do is to do a PISA test. This is the common test that they internationally prescribe. So if we can do that, then I think we can get more uh, data that's uniform data that then check whether the ones that come through this stream is better than the ones that come through this. The PISA test, or even the independent called TIMS test, Trends for International Sciences and Mathematics. So if we can get them to sit for the TIMS test, then I think we will know which is better. Yeah. Yeah, we, we are trying to do that under the reform system. We haven't quite gotten there, but uh, we will get down to getting quite a number of them so that we will then be able to be informed based on the data. Yeah. We don't know. I think the data suggests they are good here and they are good there too. So we don't know which is better. So the only time you can find out which is better is to ask them to sit for a common test. That's neither this nor that. It's more the TIMS test or the PISA test. The might be able to make a distinction between better quality. Next question, yes. Hi, Nato. So, um, I'm Yao, and I'm just a college student. My question to you as a college student is that right now, I believe in December last year, the Prime Minister said that he was going to launch some sort of a project so that we can reach one million volunteers by this year. And I don't know why, perhaps the volunteering community in Malaysia is really um, fragmented and disconnected from each other and I want to reach out to them. I also heard there's going to be one Malaysia for youth but I don't even know how to go for this event. I heard about it but it's just also disconnected. So I'm wondering what is the government doing to connect more of the youth? Like I just go to Baylor's College Sri Atama, so nearby but I don't hear much about this. Okay, one of the things that we did when Prime Minister referred to one million, the first thing we did was to get the one million youth to gather in Putrajaya. So we did two, two years running of the youth program in Putrajaya. In fact, last year, this year rather, at the event we had it running over two and a half days, when we totaled the numbers of people that came there, and I think they reached one million for the two days numbers now. Of course, the idea is not to gather people to meet over a carnival, sitting around looking at one another, it's more of encouraging them to begin to think about voluntarism in many areas. But some of them have begun to pull together and won some really fantastic youth volunteer program. 
the teeth from Malaysia is a very good example. Any teeth from Malaysia folks out here? Oh yes, very good. And I think that's a fantastic volunteer program. A lot of young people like, like this lady here uh, and many others are there. I went, I went to a school in Klang actually uh, to, to spend a couple of hours teaching English in that particular program. So I think it was really rewarding. There are many other youth programs that reach out to, say, Orang Asli and other places for the poor people. And so I encourage a lot more our young people to participate in voluntarism. And a big voluntarism program is on fighting crime. And that's why the RELA program is a big one. Rakan Cop is a big one. We have 300,000 volunteers that have now registered with the police under Rakan Cop. And hopefully a lot more of this now. What perhaps we can think about doing is to provide an inventory of some of the very good voluntary schemes around so that people can then connect there. So I, perhaps my teams can think about how we can create an inventory. So what kind of a voluntary program for youths are available and those people that are interested to join them will then be able to access them. Okay. Idris, there was another question from Twitter from yeah. that Harbert Gill who says, um, who asks, how many high-income jobs are there and where are they coming from? Okay. How many high-income jobs are there and where they're coming from? We publish actually the actual statistics in our ETP book. And it's just, and we split them into how many are in this income bracket, how many in that income bracket. I don't remember the numbers to hand at the moment, I, I must confess. But uh, what we do have them split. Now what we're trying to do now is to, to create more and more of the job in the higher income out of the 3.3 million jobs that we intend to create. And so I, I really do know the numbers. Let me just anecdotally put the numbers where I think they are coming from. Clearly there are a lot more high income jobs in the oil and gas sector, a lot more high income jobs in the financial sector, and in the services sector you'll find quite a number too in the, in the tourism sector, the high income jobs. The ones where the jobs tend to be lower income in agriculture, lower income, huh? and oil palm is sort of lower income. So in the commodities area, we have lower income, but if you look at oil and gas, and uh, in the health sector, is so higher income, the doctors, of course, much uh, higher pay than the nurses. And so these are the sectors that traditionally, but I just don't have the number to hand. But I can assure you, if you go into the ETP road, roadmap, the data is all there. Thank you. Uh, we've got one more question real quick before I pester you for another song. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Down the street. Hi, here, yeah, in the middle. All right, middle, huh? Yeah. In the green handbag. I don't think you'll be able to miss me. Uh, it's very good to hear uh, when you say crime rates down. But um, I think an average Malaysian hears crime occurring in their neighborhood almost every day. And what's even more saddening is that we hear that the police now don't want to take reports. Um, you know, and it discourages a lot of people from reporting crime. They're like, oh, dah jadi lah, kenapa nak report? You know, and we hear that on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, an average Malaysian would find it quite difficult to believe some of the numbers that is generated by, you know, Mandu or ETP. Um, you know, at the end, is word of mouth is what we, what we hear, experiences that we have, um, you know, so, what are some of the things that you could say to allay some of these fears and you know, I suppose see more concrete actions? What a lot of us are doing now is we are taking on uh, prevention, crime prevention on our own, you know. Roads now become private roads, public roads become private roads. Um, you know, we have our own security system because we can't rely on like, the police, for example. So I'd like to hear your views on that uh, and yeah. A couple Thanks. of things. Let me talk about what we're doing. Huh? Let's talk about the doing part. <clears throat> The first thing that we done under the program was to do a co program called the Police Omnipresence Program. That means mobilize the police from the non-hotspot areas to the crime hotspot areas. Altogether, the total number of police were, that were redeployed uh, were 30,000 that were moved into the hotspot areas. This Omnipresence Program, we borrowed it from NYPD. That's what they did in New York Police Department. The second thing that we're doing today is to make sure that because a lot of people complain that when they go to the police station, they are not serviced properly. They, they, the police folks are don't, don't attend to them well and their complaints that they, 
may not even take the report and, and launch it into the computer. So today, last year we began the program, we piloted it in all Balai police in Selangor. So if you've been to any Balai police in Selangor, last year or this year rather, you would have noticed there's a machine in front in the Balai police. On this machine there's a rating, number one means very bad service, number, four, number five means excellent service. So you can rate the service of that officer that attend to you by pressing the button. If you're shy to do that, at the end of the transaction, you can take away the report number, you can go home and SMS, you SMS the number, and you can rate the person number one, number two, number three, number four. And so, actually, the total number of people that rated the police over the last year is uh, something like 13,000, if I'm not mistaken, the number is 13,000. 86% of them rated the police at number four, actually. Very good. And so I'm very encouraged by that. So the people that actually go there, the, the data speaks well. Now, I know that some of you don't believe me. La. Yesterday I flew from KK. I was in Kota Kinabalu for a day trip. I came, on, I came back on Malaysia Airlines. I sat on the economy at the emergency area. La. And there was this lady that sat next to me. And next to her is, uh, is the husband. So the guy looked at me and said, you look familiar. I said, are you, are you Dato Sri Idris Jala? I said, yes, I am. Very good, he said. I want to talk to you about crime. We spent two hours on the plane talking about crime. And the, the wife was right in the middle, you know. I pulled out my iPad and showed him all the data. He refused to believe. So I said, look, I know you're entitled to your opinion. So we talk. Actually, the wife was also tired because two hours of talking about crime, really, really demoralizing and also depressing. Nonetheless, by the time we finished talking, he said, OK, like this, I've seen the data. I believe you, he said. But you know, I believe the data shows it's come down. But you know what, I think you guys in the government have been there a long time. If you give chance to the opposition, maybe they will bring it lower than you all. Like. <laughs> So, so that said, I mean, that pre, uh, predisposition of people is also a political issue. In that conversation that I had, the, the guy accepted that yeah, it's come down based on the data, but I told him it's not zero, it's 430 incidents of crime per day. That's not a lot, but if you like, if you go to the website called Nation Master, today you Google even during uh, you go to blog today and type Nation Master, you will see the stats of all the countries where the incidence of crime. The world defines incidence of crime per 100,000 people. Let me tell you, Malaysia's number is 505 out of 100,000 people. Singapore is 606 out of 100,000. UK is 6,000 over, 6,100. 6,100 in the UK. South Africa is 3,000 per 100,000. So, the point is, is that when you look at data, how do people compare data is incidents of crime that take place in the country. And so that is why when you look at it today, the data speaks for itself. If you look at Nation Master, go and type data, that's all the incidents of crime that exist. Nonetheless, I would say Malaysia's crime rate is low but it's not zero. Let me say one more time, I never say do not report crime. Let me be very clear. I never said to the newspaper, please get you. Please do not report. I never said. I simply said, crime report is not the way to measure the incidence of crime. You must count all the incidents of crime. Then it's the measurement. So you can report. Nobody gags the media from doing the report. But of course, there's, I know there's one or two particular portal that said it just wants to gag the newspaper. I never said. I believe in freedom of expression. I absolutely believe in that. And I, the world would be a terrible place when we have no freedom to speak. Of course you can. I will simply say that we must exercise the rights to express ourselves, to speak our mind in a country that's a mature and functional democracy. But we must also be factual in the way we report. Thank you. Uh, it is, could, we get a, could we get another song? Come again. Could we get another song? Oh, all right, all right. Oh, I can although, before you start the song though, there was a question on Twitter. Is there any chance at all that Chelsea is going to hold on to their Champions Cup? Champions League Cup. Any chance at all? That Chelsea will? 
well, you know, be, hold on to their championship. Go, I'll come again. I believe <laughs> Hold on to their championship. Any chance? The Chelsea will become? No, will they hold on to their championship? Any chance at all? I really didn't get that. Really. <laughs> you know, I, I'm getting old, you know. Will they maintain their championship at all? Oh, Any right. chance? Or is Manchester United... Of course, United of course, of course. Of course. Let me tell you, we are blessed in Chelsea because... Uh, very, very blessed. I only have one complaint about the Prime Minister. Uh, because he didn't tell me that Mourinho was going to see him. I saw in the newspaper that our Prime Minister had a, a session with Mourinho, Jose Mourinho. If only I knew that he was going to see Jose Mourinho, I would have sat outside his office for days to make sure I get the signature. I, I missed them. I believe that we will win. I tell you why. Because we have now, we brought in the wingers. The problem with Chelsea before, we didn't have good wingers, creative wingers. So we've got in the wingers now, uh, so that, that we can have flair for Banco Marin and uh, Eden Hazard. So I believe we will get there. And if we can get Hawk, I tell you the world will change. <laughs> and uh, we've got a, a guy that is probably untested as our manager. And uh, so I believe that that he, he came out almost by fluke to be there, but nonetheless we won. So everybody thinks that we have invented a new form of playing, it's called the boring way of playing. Put the bus in front of the goal mouth and then let Barcelona come and then we come to attack them. It's very boring but very effective. Thank you.
started to uh, to tweet about a year ago. My folks in Pamandu, you know, Indi, I don't know if she's there, and Salina, and, uh, and they all were pressing me to do it. I was really reluctant. I said I might be consumed by this thing called Twitter. Like, what the hell is Twitter? And I spoke to my son. He said, it's not frightening. It's not a ghost. He said, it's just expressing your opinion. It took me a long time to do it. The only way I could start the process was, some of you may remember if you followed me from there I started. The only way I could master the courage to do it is to start tweeting on Chelsea, because that's my passion. I realized when I started tweet on Chelsea, I didn't get barraged by the folks from menu. They, they ignored me on Liverpool. But nonetheless, I got encouraged by it, and I, I think it's a great tool to reach out to people and, uh, and engage. But nonetheless, I also find a lot of problems with Twitter, because you can't put very long sentences, <laughs> nor can you put data and facts on the table. So every time I express an opinion, the guy just replied and said, bullshit. <laughs> You can say whatever you like I don't believe you anyway Early one morning he As I look out Across the worn out plains On a Saturday I walked to Patanang Jaya I can look along there to the fake jeans I look at some watches That's what they say Malaysia Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sri. That was quite the performance. <laughs> um, uh, guys, the mic's not over yet. Um, if you still have any uh, questions, Dr. Sri is going to be mingling around, so feel free to track him down and, you know, interrogate. That's why he's here. Um, there are also a whole bunch of other people from Pomando around us that did I